I may have to. There's a possibility I may have to leave you early today, so I'll just apologize now if I have to. So. No worries. Did you have anything you want to say today, Steve? I'm not a past district governor yet, so I'm giving Jim a bad time here. But you know, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I see Don's on there too, so I give Don a bet. You have any uh, hopes of getting back in person or doing hybrid or anything like that? Or what's what's your club's? Uh, uh, I think we're still maybe shooting for that summer timeline right now, okay. but I think we're going to see what we can do about doing hybrid even when we can resume in person. There's a lot of clubs doing it. So yeah, in Boone, we went back to going hybrid here the first of March or first of February. So. But they were a lot smaller yeah. clubs than you guys. So, but I do see some large clubs are doing it. But they're doing, you know, first 20, first 30. You got to sign up to be the ones that come, you know, right number. So, right. Well, um, it is 12.02. And uh, I know there's more people jumping on here by the minute and Karen's continuing to admit people, but uh, let's go ahead and get started and welcome everyone to the February 15th meeting of the Rotary Club of Ames. As always, uh, if you can and stand and you are able to stand, uh, please join along in our virtual Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And uh, obviously happy President's Day to everyone. So uh, Pledge of Allegiance can mean a little bit more on this historic celebration of presidents past, present and future, and certainly will keep them in our thoughts uh, moving forward. Um, also, I'm aware uh, that uh, Gerald Klonglin uh, could use uh, some thoughts and prayers. So Gerald uh, did suffer a minor stroke. Uh, he is at Mary Greeley Medical Center recovering well. Um, and I think uh, he does have his computer, but I think he has been coached, and rightfully so, to just try to take it easy. So if someone wanted to maybe send him a card or a note, that'd be great. Uh, we'll just certainly keep Gerald in our thoughts and prayers this morning. Are there any others that um, we should be aware of right now? If anyone knows of anyone else, we should keep in our thoughts this morning. Looks like we have uh, from Allison, that Frankie Olson has set up a Caring Bridge website for updates. Thank you, Allison, for that. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and take a moment uh, for our president, our past presidents, um, Frankie Olson, and of course, uh, most recently here, Gerald Klonglin and Eileen as well. Thank you. Chad, it may just be me. What was the Frankie Olson? Uh, yeah, sorry. It's a couple weeks ago. It was announced that Frankie is uh, battling uh, some pretty significant cancer. Uh, Jean Cressy had brought that up. You know, sorry if, if someone missed that. So she's also asked that uh, people respect her uh, wishes to kind of lay low and not necessarily reach out or call or uh, anything at this point in time. So thanks for clarifying, Joe. Thank you. Yes. 
Uh, announcements. Um, <clears throat> oh, before we get to announcements. Yeah, we have a special day. We have Louie is going to unmute uh, and sing our welcome song. But get ready, because after that, Louie is going to stay unmuted. And he's going to sing a special song uh, today for our uh, centennial celebration. Uh, Louie will be singing a song uh, to commemorate international projects and scholars. So we'll go ahead and start with the welcome song, Louie, and then take it away for the celebration song as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and hello to all you Rotarians. Here's the old welcome song. Welcome to you from Ames Rotary, Neve to London or Gay Paris, from far off lands or the USA. We're glad that you are here today. Come back again whenever you're near. Join us and then we'll make it clear. Around the world you will always be welcome at Rotary. And continuing to the uh, special song that Charles, Charles has written some words to um, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning, uh, the Rogers and Hammerstein hit song from Oklahoma. And it's called Oh, What a Beautiful Story. There are three different verses and they all have to do with things that uh, are uh, international projects or scholars. So here it goes. Yes, there's paid. Yes, yes, there's faded blue gold on our pages, but a bright gold and blue on our badges. The needs are as high as a skyscraper's top, and they look like they're growing, not likely to stop. Oh, what a challenging future with an inspiring past. We've got a beautiful feeling, doing good things that will last. All the world now is facing new normal. They need changes, both formal, informal. Let's send them our scholars, they are a real prize. And welcome guest scholars, their knowledge so wise. Oh, what a challenging future with an inspiring past. We've got a beautiful feeling, doing good things that will last. Hear the sound of the earth for pure water. Hear the dream of all students for learning. Vaccinations are given, there's more to be done. Join our planet's good neighbors by acting as one. Oh, what a beautiful story. Oh, what a beautiful sight. We've got a beautiful mission, doing what's good and what's right. Oh, what a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you, Louie. Thank you, Charles and the music committee. That was awesome. We got to make sure that's, that one's in the archives. So, yeah, challenging future, but uh, a whole lot of bright brightness in that story. Thank you for singing and sharing that song. Speaking of Centennial Committee and Celebration, hopefully everyone has this mask. Um, uh, Jeff Johnson, who's chairing our Celebration Committee, has asked that we all wear our mask on March 1st to start our meeting, again in celebration of beginning our second century of service. So uh, if you don't have one, please shoot Karen and email, email, but uh, everyone should have their masks right now. Compliments of the Centennial Celebration Committee. Unless so I have them, committee. unless I have them because I have not delivered mine. So if you call, you may be on my list. <laughs> Don't uh -oh. look like that, Karen. I was busy last week. They're coming. <laughs> <laughs> At least you admitted it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then last week, you know, we kept the meeting open after our program 
for a few minutes, and I thought we had some good fellowship. So um, we'll do that again today. Uh, if it's so popular that we have to in the future, then we'll we'll start some breakout rooms and maybe some have some things to talk about in our rooms. But uh, if you're interested just to hang out for a little bit of informal fellowship after this meeting, just hang on and we'll keep the meeting open for a few minutes just to talk. And I don't have any other announcements for the day. Uh, we have an exciting program today and I'm excited to have uh, Liz Beck introduce our program for the day. Thank you, Chad. Um, so today we have Anna Buckhart Thomas, um, who is the aviation ecologist for the Iowa DNR, and she works within the department's wildlife diversity program out of the Boone Wildlife Center uh, and the research station. She's been with the DNR since July 2019, and she's a steering committee member for Bird Friendly Iowa, which is the topic of our presentation today. She grew up in northeastern Illinois and has been a birder all of her life. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in wildlife ecology from the University oh, and Management from Michigan Technology University and her Master's of Science in Wildlife Ecology from the University of Maine. She's most interested in conducting monitoring research and outreach that is direct application to the bird conservation in Iowa. So <clears throat> I'm a backyard birder, I'm not a serious birder, um, but I do get an Audubon update. And so I went out on the Audubon page that I got this morning and I looked up vulnerable birds in Story County and I could do that by my zip code. I ended up getting the um, summer schedule instead of the winter, but we have um, high, highly vulnerable species are nine Moderate vulnerability for species is 21. Low vulnerability for species is 23. And our stable species is 42. So maybe Anna can pop some of that in here. But um, just it's an Audubon website, audubonbirds or something.com. And I would encourage you to go look at it because today is the special day where you sit inside and watch birds because you don't want to go outside. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anna. Is she with us, Karen? I am, thank you, Liz. Oh, great, Anna, hi. Hello, um, excellent. Let me just share my screen here. I have a quick presentation to share. Okay, so thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, as Liz said, I am the avian ecologist with the um, IODNR. So I study birds and particularly I focus on the non-game species that we have here in Iowa. So our songbirds and our grassland birds and um, all those fun things that visit our feeders. So today I'm excited to talk to you about um, a program called Bird Friendly Iowa and you'll be happy to know that Ames is a bird friendly Iowa community and so we'll get into what that all means um, but so today I'm, I'm speaking from the, the standpoint of a steering, com member, a steer steering committee member for the Bird Friendly Iowa um, organization. So just uh, kind of a little bit of background. 20% um, of Iowans are uh, watchbirds in some capacity, whether it's in their backyards, especially on cold days like today, um, or during COVID lockdowns and what all those sorts of things where we can enjoy the birds in our backyard. Um, or they travel to look at birds in Iowa. And they spend more than $860 million a year in Iowa watching wildlife. And the majority of that is spent on bird watching and bird feeding. Um, and so that is more than the amount of money that our hunters and anglers spend in Iowa each year. And so um, birding and bird watching and enjoying birds in your backyard is a really important part of our economy in Iowa. Um, so quickly, I just wanted to give you um, kind of on top of what Liz said in terms of those um, levels of threat to different birds. Uh, I just wanted to give you kind of a little bit of an overview of the status of North America's birds right now. So 
Unfortunately, it's not looking great. Um, a recent paper that was published in Science um, in 2019 showed that 30% of the birds in North America have been lost since 1970. So that's almost 3 billion individual birds that no longer exist within the span of a single human's lifetime. Um, and so that's really concerning. And so just to highlight some of these findings, um, this included a 53% decrease in grassland birds, which is, you know, the things like the Eastern meadowlark that we love so much here in Iowa. That means that three in four of every Eastern meadowlark has been lost since the 1970s. That's 720 million individual birds lost since the 1970s. And so these are really concerning uh, and worrisome figures. When we think about, um, this, this major loss, a lot of it is the migratory birds. So those birds that are here for the summer that we love to see and hear singing, um, but they're not with us here in the winter most of the time. So 28%, uh, there's been a 28% decrease in those migratory bird populations since 1970. So for example, two in every five Baltimore Orioles have disappeared since 1970. And that is 2.5 billion migratory birds lost. Again, staggering numbers. So um, we're, we really need to be looking out for our environment and our birds right now um, to make sure that these declines don't continue. So why, why are these declines happening? Well, there's a lot of threats that birds face. Um, so things like building collisions, for example, here's a single building that um, in May of 2017 on a single migratory night where these birds are flying north to breed um, in the northern part of North America. They hit here in this case, this was Galveston, Texas. They fly across the Gulf of Mexico and then they land on the coast uh, into Texas and lit up buildings can be um, very disorienting and kind of a, a magnet to these birds. And so in this one instance, 400 birds were found dead below this tower in a single night. Um, since then, this building has done some uh, some changes to the way that they light up their, their structures and things to try to reduce this. Um, but this is, is not an isolated case. This can happen anywhere. Um, even, you know, just one bird here and there at someone's home uh, adds up when we think about it at the scale of North America. Um, but in addition to threats like bird collision, this, there's vehicle collisions. Um, cats that are left outdoors can be uh, they're excellent predators, and so they can can uh, wreak havoc on the local bird populations. Um, you know, habitat loss is a huge issue both here in North America and South America, where a lot of these birds spend their winter. So there's a lot of factors going on um, that threaten these birds, and so it's becoming harder and harder for birds to be able to, and wildlife in general, to be able to find what they need to survive in human altered landscapes. Um, but I don't wanna be all doom and gloom. I do wanna highlight some of our successes. So there is some good news associated with these numbers. Um, our raptor populations have increased 200% since 1970. So we've gotten 15 million more raptors. And largely this is due to the efforts um, surrounding the pesticide DDT that had a huge impact on our bald eagles and our other raptors um, in terms of their survival and, and you know, issues with their eggs breaking. And so when we decided to really tackle that issue of removing DDT, um, our raptor populations really rebounded. We also have uh, great success stories with our waterfowl. So we are up 56% since um, 1970 or 35 million waterfowl. And so this again was a concerted effort across the, the country and, a, and between Canada and the US to say, our waterfowl are in trouble. We need to do something to protect their habitats and their wetlands that they, um, that they need to survive. And so um, those concerted large scale efforts have really worked to help our waterfowl populations. Um, and woodpeckers are another great example of something that's been um, increasing since 1970. So um, a lot smaller increases in that sense, but 18% um, larger population of woodpeckers since the 1970s. And so knowing that we are experiencing high uh, bird declines, um, 
here are seven simple actions that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, and the authors of that paper that published the three million birds have disappeared since 1970. Um, there are seven simple actions that they recommend that any person can do to try to help reverse these declines. So avoiding pesticides wherever possible, um, using native plants in your yards, keeping your cats indoors or on a leash, um, making sure that your windows are safe and birds don't hit them and injure themselves or die, um, doing citizen science, things like the Christmas bird count or backyard bird counting um, to help scientists at a broad scale understand these population changes, reducing your plastic use and drinking shade grown coffee, um, which is a, a scenario where um, birds can thrive within those coffee plants and you can still get your coffee. And so it's a win-win for both scenarios. So um, this is kind of just the framing of, of the big picture of where birds are today and, and how we're thinking about birds in terms of conservation in North America. So now I'm gonna bring in um, Bird Friendly Iowa. And so Bird Friendly Iowa, um, as you may have noticed, is a group in Iowa that promotes birds and habitat conservation throughout the state. And um, this is a collaboration with many partners across the state. And so these partners are working together to um, increase habitat protection and bird conservation actions, as well as outreach and education surrounding birds in Iowa. So Bird Friendly Iowa has three main goals. The first um, is to protect and restore and enhance bird habitat. So uh, making sure that we have natural spaces that support these birds for breeding and food and all the things that they need to survive and thrive. Reducing the threats to birds. So making sure that we um, are controlling things that we can in terms of making life easier for those birds. And then educating, engaging um, with people around birding conservation. So making sure that we involve the public and encourage people of all ages to be interested in birds. So um, Bird Friendly Iowa recognizes um, Iowa communities, either at the city level or the county level. And so um, we have a list of 30 criteria within those three different categories, um, across those three categories. And so a community that meets seven to nine criteria, depending on the size of that community, um, it depends on, you know, if they're a smaller community, we ask that you you, you have a smaller number of um, criteria that need to be met to be considered bird friendly. And the larger your community is, we ask that you do up to nine criteria to be considered bird friendly. Um, and so we ask these communities and counties to look through our criteria and decide which ones they meet um, and then describe to us how they're meeting that criteria, what they're doing in terms of that, uh, habitat enhancement, that education, or that um, threat reduction to birds. And so every one of these communities is then recognized with um, two metal signs that they can put up, a flag they can fly, and then each community also gets a, um, a certificate recognizing their um, bird-friendly behavior. So right now, uh, Bird Friendly Iowa started uh, in earnest in 2016, so it's a fairly new initiative, but up to, to date, we, we are getting some great participation, and these are the communities that are currently recognized as bird friendly. Um, so we started off with Waterloo in 2017, um, Pleasant Hill, Denver, Cedar Falls, Madrid, and Ames was uh, our, one of our new communities in 2020. Um, and then uh, we also have several counties that have um, become bird friendly, and Story County is one of those as well. So I just wanted to highlight today to you all which um, of those criteria Ames meets to become a bird friendly community. So Ames went above and beyond and did more than the minimum criteria number to be able to be considered bird friendly. We had a wonderful application um, that was put together with different community members and uh, a city engineer. And so um, they did a really great job of uh, showing that they really care about the birds and um, are doing great things in the community to make sure that those those birds can can be healthy um, in Ames. So um, 
Within our protect, restore, and enhance bird habitat category, these are some of the criteria that I met. So their first criteria was that the community has prepared a park system or open space habitat assessment. And so um, Ames is blessed with many wonderful parks. Um, I live in Ames actually, so I am very familiar with all of this. Um, and so there's wonderful parks. And so there is a, uh, a park habitat um, you know, assessment and plan for those parks. Um, the second criteria is that there's a list of bird species that have uh, been recorded at this within the community. And so here's an example uh, of some of the birds on that list. So um, in Ames, there have been 302 species recorded. Um, and so this list was put together by um, Bruce Ayersman, who was the previous uh, avian ecologist for the state of Iowa and is another one of our steering committee members and a person who lives in Ames. And so, um, you know, 302 species can be seen in, Iowa, in, in Ames itself, in our parks and in our backyards. Um, and then a portion of the community's land has legal protection through public ownership or conservation. Again, a lot of our parks fit into that category. And then park management provides native habitat for birds, plants, and other wildlife. A lot of the um, landscaping in our parks is native plants, which is great for native wildlife. Um, again, in this category, the community has a program to enhance, uh, to encourage native habitat development on private property and does not restrict wild or natural lawns comprised of native plants and species. So this is a, a wonderful aspect of, of where we live. Um, there are actually incentives for people to plant native plants um, in their in their yards, and to not necessarily have to have a grass only lawn um, that needs to be mowed every few weeks in the summer. Um, so there's great information on that through the Ames Smart Watersheds program. And if you're not familiar with this program, I really encourage you to go on Ames, the City of Ames website, and check it out. There's some great resources there, um, and like I said, there's even financial incentives to um, put native plants in your yard and some great uh, information about how to get started. Um, and then in this category, the, this community is also designated a tree city USA, um, which again, just means that we have great native trees uh, throughout the city. And we have a, a stormwater management program that reduces polluted runoff and ensures protection for wetlands, including um, riparian and other aquatic ecosystems and it promotes the use of native plantings to accomplish management goals. So um, the, here's an example from, from the Ames website uh, within their stormwater program. Here's a, a drone shot and actually a video of the South Skunk River. Um, and they did a stabilization pro project there um, to make sure that we weren't having excessive erosion and, and runoff into our river. So in our second category, um, this is the reducing threats to birds. So um, those things like, uh, you know, window collisions and uh, vehicle collisions and, and those sorts of things that we can take actions to reduce those impacts to birds. So the first one is that the community has regulatory or administrative programs to control free roaming cats and actively publicizes the cats indoors campaign. So um, there is a leash law in Ames. Um, and so if you have a, a cat, you it must stay on a leash if you're outdoors with it. Um, and so that protects our birds. Um, cats, by no fault of their own, are excellent predators. And so um, when we aren't able to you know, supervise them, they can go off and, and effectively capture birds, mammals, anything that's out there. Um, and so making sure that we, we are being responsible about where our cats go um, helps reduce those threats to birds. And so in our, um, I believe this is at the library, there is information available about cats, birds, and you, um, and some other programs surrounding uh, bird, bird safety and cats. And here is an example of an Ames resident who has in, constructed something called a catio which is basically a patio for cats, or in this case, a screened in porch, you know? And so this cat gets to go outside and enjoy the fresh air, um, but is still 
separated from the wildlife and so it can't have that negative impact. Um, in uh, some other cat, uh, criteria that were met in Ames is that the community provides information on how businesses and homes can protect birds from window collisions. So um, birds have a hard time seeing glass and understanding that it's something that they can't fly through, um, particularly in areas where there's nice vegetation surrounding it and that vegetation reflects into the window. And so the bird sees the reflection of a tree and thinks, oh, I can fly to that tree and then hits a window. And so um, here the city again is providing information about how to um, save birds from flying into windows and some great opportunities for anyone, business, home, any scenario to um, make it so that this glass is visible and to reduce that threat to birds. Um, it's estimated that up to a billion birds a year die from collisions with windows in North America. Um, and so that's a, it's a really big impact. So even on a local level, if you can reduce those threats, even in your backyard, we're doing great work. So um, the next criteria that they met was that the community supports bird-friendly construction and placement of communication towers. So I mentioned that um, lit up buildings can be an attractant to birds. Um, lit up communication towers have the same effect. So um, there are now, in Ames and in other areas, there are um, regulations in place that are appropriate for um, the, the regulations around surrounding flight, but um, you know, commercial airplanes and things but that also reduce their impact to birds. So having a flashing light on top of your tower instead of a constant light can help birds um, realize that or not be drawn to those towers in the same way and reduce the um, possibility of a bird running into the communication tower or the guy wires that hold that tower up. And then the community has a program to reduce pesticide use on public lands. Um, and or edu an educational effort to reduce pesticide use by home and property owners. So part of that smart watershed um, uh, initiative in Ames is that they encourage um, native plants and they encourage reduction of pesticide use um, on your lawns and, and in your um, backyard. And so again, on their website, there's lots of information about more uh, bird-friendly alternatives or scenarios where you can plant a native species and not need those pesticides at all. Um, so there's great uh, information there and there there's a lot of um, wonderful yards as you drive around the Ames. There's such a variety of, of different landscaping and, and lots of it is native plants. So to our third and final category, birds, um, is this educate and engage people in birding and conservation. And so um, here again, Ames went above and beyond and met a lot of criteria. The first criteria that they met was that the schools in the community are implementing Flying Wild, um, which is a curriculum uh, created by Audubon to educate and engage young students about birds. Um, so in this case, um, they, in Ames, the actual, the, the local Audubon chapter purchased Audubon Adventure Kits, which is a similar um, curriculum. They purchased Audubon Adventure Kits for um, schools throughout Story County. And so I think 24 of those kits ended up in Ames schools. And so those students then are, are learning about birds through, those, through that Audubon Adventures program. Um, and of course, Story County has wonderful programming and a lot of our students are able to work with those um, within those programs and their, their Story County naturalists um, do a lot of programming that um, some of it incorporates birds and other conservation issues. Um, the next one is that through bulletin boards, brochures and publications in City Hall, Public Library, other public spaces, um, newsletters, websites, and other media, the community provides information to property owners on methods for creating and enhancing backyard habitat. So this is a picture I took straight from the Ames City website. They have a whole section on bird-friendly community, 
and they have lots of resources linked here um, all about woodland management plans. Um, they link to other sites that have more information about, um, for example, American Bird Conservancy has great information about reducing threats to birds and things. And so um, here's that link of where I found this information. It's within that stormwater program. So for a lot of, of the bird-friendly initiatives within the city, that stormwater program is kind of the launch point. So moving on, um, the next criteria that the city met is that we had local news media periodically running stories about migratory birds and habitat conservation. And the community is represented in at least one bird monitoring program, such as the Great Backyard Bird Count, Audubon Christmas Bird Count, Project Feeder Watch, or other coordinated citizen science projects. So citizen science is this scenario where anyone can volunteer to collect data that then uh, can be used by scientists to um, answer questions uh, of interest. So um, this is an example in the Ames Tribune. This example actually touches on both. So here is a news media article that highlights uh, the participation in the Christmas bird count in Ames. And so um, this was a few years ago, but every year uh, different citizens throughout Ames participate in this Christmas bird count and contribute data um, that then gets used on a national level to understand our winter bird populations. Uh, another one of these cat uh, criteria within our educate and engage um, section is that the community has a program that involves schools, garden clubs, or organizations in habitat development of butterfly and bird conservation activities uh, or butterfly and bird conservation activities. And so um, Ames has great examples of many community partners. And so um, there are the Friends of Ada Hayden Heritage Park, there's the Friends of Brookside Park. Um, the Community Academy uh, does lots of education and outreach with students um, in our local areas, all surrounding native habitats and native wildlife. Uh, finally, the community provides information regarding safe and responsible wildlife rescue and assistance, including contact information for aligned organizations and Iowa permitted wildlife rehabilitators. So um, there's a section on the website in Ames about wildlife in Ames, um, and they have a whole section about birds. And so there's information about um, where to contact a rehabber if you have an issue with birds. Um, and so all that information is available to the city of Ames residents uh, on what to do and how to help birds. Oh, I missed one seat. Ames went so far above and beyond that I lost count of all their excellent criteria that they've met. Um, so I think this is the final one now, um, but Ames has, uh, one of our criteria is kind of a make your own sort of criteria. So this is a criteria that's, that says to demonstrate in a narrative some other community accomplishment um, and public education about native birds and bird watching. And so, uh, or other forms of wildlife. And so Ames highlighted their Tedesco Environmental Learning Corridor, which was a project um, in, in coordination with Story County Conservation. Um, and so if you haven't been to this area in Ames, I really encourage you to do so. It's kind of a unique spot. Um, they've got great examples of green infrastructure, um, as well as native landscaping and planting and a nice um, area to, to interact with the environment and see a variety of restored wetlands and forest. And so this is, this is a great thing for the city to have highlighted in their application. So altogether, Ames has been doing a wonderful job of being bird friendly. Um, and the fact that they've met all those criteria has meant that we've recognized them, Bird Friendly Iowa and our steering committee have recognized them for their efforts as a bird friendly community. And so they've been given signs and a flag and their certificate um, in 2020. And so each year we'll ask the city to reapply um, and say, yes, we're still doing these things. Yes, we're still bird friendly. And so each year there's an opportunity 
for people to continue to build on the great efforts that Ames has been doing so far. And as an individual resident of Ames, you all have an opportunity to do your part as well, to take part in some of these seven simple actions to help birds. So things like reducing pesticide use on your lawns, moving towards native gardens, buying bird-friendly coffee, all those sorts of actions can really help birds, especially if you do it and your neighbor does it and your friends do it and all of a sudden Ames is an even better place for birds. And so I really encourage you to go on the Ames website and check out all their great resources on that stormwater um, program page. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the Bird Friendly Iowa program or the Ames specific bird friendly initiatives um, or just about anything bird related. Anna, thank you. That has been very informative. So thank you very much. Um, there's one thing that this club is good at, and it's good at asking questions. So we've gotten Excellent. really good on these virtual meetings. We have some really good questions. I'll just go ahead and pull some out of the chat so you don't have to watch them, and then I'll, uh, I'll relay them to you. Uh, Great. So first question was about bird loss in areas of the U.S. that are sparsely populated also you know, not just around the, the urban areas. <clears throat> yeah, so um, bird loss can happen anywhere. Um, some of those threats are definitely amplified in cities, um, you know, things like buildings and vehicles and communication towers and all of those. Um, but even poor habitat or invasive plant species can affect birds, even in some of our more remote or, or less urbanized areas. So, um, or, you know, even a single collision on a small family home um, can be amplified across lots of small family homes with bird collisions. And so these threats may be amplified in those urban areas, but there's definitely something everyone can do anywhere, depending on no matter how densely populated the area is. Thank you. And then um, Liz talked about something that I had no idea about. So you talked about shade grown coffee. Unfortunately, I'm, if I'm drinking non shade grown coffee, I'm contributing to a lot of uh, loss of birds because I drink lots of coffee. Uh, but how were there certain brands that we should be purchasing or how should we know about sure. the coffee that we're drinking? Yeah. So um, shade grown coffee there is a program that has been started by Audubon, I believe, and they actually have a seal that they put on the packaging that says shade grown bird friendly coffee. Um, and I think there was an example of that seal on that last page. So um, it's not necessarily always easy to find, um, but if you're, you can, you can definitely order online. Um, and I think there's probably some locations around town that sell it. Um, but if you look for that seal, that's the best way to find it or, or just do an easy Google search of what, you know, what groups do bird friendly coffee and, and who should I be considering trying as my next coffee choice. So, yeah. And I think a lot of people just don't realize that um, the coffee you're drinking might not be helping birds. You just don't think about that. And that's totally understandable. But um, in those shade grown coffee scenarios, they have native trees and understory of coffee. And so birds can thrive in that habitat that's also producing a coffee crop for us to enjoy. Thank you. And then a uh, question about the crow population. So on Iowa State University campus, if you're a student or you're a faculty member or an employee there, you probably think the crow population is up about 3000% because that's your <laughs> uh, notice. But talk about that a little bit. Sure. So. Um, those crow populations definitely seem really large because in the winter, they congregate in communal roosting areas. So um, as you said, around the campus, there are lots and lots of crows that come and congregate every evening um, in winter. And so we definitely, we see a lot of them at once and you think, wow, crows are doing amazing. Um, and I wouldn't say that crow is, is one that's necessarily our most at risk species at this point, but there are, um, there have been times, for example, crows were pretty uh, affected by West Nile disease. And so about 10 years ago, there was a lot of issues with that. And so crow populations were declining at that point. And now they've rebounded a little bit. And so that might be something that you're remembering. There didn't used to be this many crows in Ames. Um, 
And now there's this, just this huge roosting community. And also those roosts shift um, as resources shift and as habitat shifts. And so, um, you know, it may have been that that roost existed and it was just in a less visible spot. And so now we're really just noticing them. Thank you. And uh, another question about native versus non-native plants. Can you talk a little bit more about the benefits to birds of planting the native versus non-native plants? Sure. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So one of the easiest ways to make your backyard bird friendly is to use native plants. So native plants um, are trees, grasses, shrubs, forbs, and, and beautiful flowers, whatever it is, their um, habitat and their adaptations are specific to where we live here in Iowa. And so they are um, they're adapted to the soil we have, they're adapted to the amount of water we get and the amount of rain we get, they're adapted to how sunny it is here in Iowa. And for all of those reasons, they're easier to take care of for humans. So for example, we don't have to water the plants as much. We don't have to um, spend money on fertilizers and pesticides to keep those help plants healthy because they're natively here. And so they grow better here than um, a non-native plant would. They also, because they're native, our native birds have evolved with those plants. And so those birds are um, adapted to use those plants for food or um, to eat the insects that are associated with that plant. And so when we plant non-native plants, we're not providing them the same food source that they would get with a native plant. So um, it's been shown that non-native plants actually um, they support fewer insects and a lot of our birds rely on insects, especially when they're feeding their babies in the summer. And so, um, and it's not necessarily even the insects we don't like. It's not mosquitoes and all the biting flies and that sort of thing. It's just the native, the native bugs that would stay up in the tree and you wouldn't even know they were there, but the birds find them and eat them. And so the more native plants we can provide, um, the easier it is for us to take care of our lawns and the easier it is for birds to find food and, and breeding locations. So that's that's the short of it, but I can preach about <laughs> native plants all day if you want to stop me. So. That's certainly helpful. Uh, we have Linda Lauver, one of our club members said it on her farm, they actually participate in the conservation reserve program and they noticed the habitat was huge improvement quickly uh, with regards to that. Yeah, definitely. That CRP program has been amazing for grassland birds in Iowa. And then another question is, uh, which this is kind of a logical question, how does bird counting account for double, triple counting of birds? How do you know that you're being unique in counting birds? That's a great question. So um, for some of those citizen science type programs like the Christmas bird count, for example, um, they're very careful to try to ask participants to only count a bird once. So, um, it's impossible to know for sure sometimes because of course they're flying around and singing and moving and so it's hard to know but um, for for counts that we're basing our you know population estimates off of we have ways of standardizing those counts to make sure that we're only counting a single individual once um, and so for for things like that um, three billion birds program that was largely based off of a, a long-term data set called the breeding bird survey and that is conducted in a way that there are multiple points along a 10 mile route. Um, and those points are only visited for a few minutes at a time and you only record every time you see the bird the first time you see it or hear it. So there are some ways to try to reduce those double countings. And that's definitely taken to, into account when, when scientists do these analyses and figure out you know, what our population's really looking like. And then, uh... Jeff, I may need you to clarify your question here about, is there any legislation being pursued um, with regards to, I don't know, more, more bird friendly legislation? Is that what you're talking about? Well, since that first number of how much is put into the economy, which I looked at that as there's an opportunity here for making money and having this population grow what are we doing with our legislators to educate them on both of these subjects? And are we, and is there any legislation that's being considered? Sure. Um, 
In Iowa specifically, I don't think there's any bird related legislation right now um, that I'm aware of. Um, I know that there are groups in Iowa advocating for bird friendly practices in general. Um, groups like Iowa Ornithologist Union, Iowa Audubon, um, you know, Bird Friendly Iowa. And so there is some of that on a national scale. There's also some um, legislation kind of in the works about, um, there was a bill recently about uh, bird friendly construction of federal buildings um, and making sure that we're reducing collision to windows and that sort of thing. So um, there are parts of it uh, happening, but that may be an opportunity for you and your group to continue to advocate for birds. Um, in that capacity. Unfortunately, as a, as a DNR state employee, I cannot really participate in that sort of thing. Um, and so we rely on, on partner groups and organizations like you to you know, put in the good word for, for birds and, and our natural resources. Thank you. Uh, and then Max Porter sounds like he has a specific question about Cooper Hawks and Starlings. Is there any way to influence them uh, from taking over the bird feeders? Sure. So um, European starlings are a non-native species. Um, and so, and they also really, they congregate into large groups and they really love bird feeders. And like you said, they take over once they show up. Um, so for starlings, there are some bird feeders you can use that have um, exclusion devices. For example, there's some feeders that um, if a bird that's too heavy sits on it, it pushes down on the uh, like on the little seeding area and it closes the bird feeder off so birds can't get to the seed. Um, so, you know, the chickadees can eat, but the starlings couldn't, for example. And there's also, you know, some bird feeders have a cage structure with a hole. And so if the bird's too big to fit through the hole, it can't get to feed, but that may also exclude some of the birds like woodpeckers that are larger. Um, another thing is to try to reduce, uh, make sure you're not using millet in your seed mix. Um, the starlings really like that, but a lot of the other birds don't. And so if you have a lot of millet in your seed mix, it might be attracting starlings more than the other birds. Um, unfortunately, starlings are one of those hard ones that once you get them, sometimes you can take your feeders down for a week or two and they'll find somewhere else to, to feed and then you can put them back up and you'll get the native birds back. But um, starlings are a constant battle for all of us. And in terms of Cooper's hawks, um, Cooper's hawks sometimes find these bird feeders and, and, you know, it's really just a bird feeder for them as well because Cooper's hawks eat birds is what they eat. Um, and so um, providing seeds for birds congregates birds and then Cooper's hawks think that this is an easy meal for me. So the best way to reduce Cooper's hawk action at your bird feeders is to take your bird feeder down for a week or two and um, kind of encourage that Cooper's hawk to think, oh, this isn't a reliable food source for me and to move its hunting territory somewhere else. But again, uh, Cooper's hawks are eating. So if you're attracting birds, you might be attracting those hawks as well that predate on those, those smaller birds. Um, a couple more questions here. One about the um, ISU campus. Uh, would you characterize ISU as bird friendly, uh, the campus? And is that part of, are you aware of, is that part of the landscape planning as it relates to the university? So um, I haven't spent a ton of time on the campus itself and I'm not super familiar with it. I, I haven't, you know, I never attended school at this campus, but um, I would say some aspects of Iowa's campus are probably bird friendly, um, but they, Iowa State was not really included too much in the Ames specific, um, their application for bird friendly Iowa. So I don't know if it's that they didn't have partners there and didn't work with them on the application or if they didn't have, or if they didn't meet those qualifications. So unfortunately, I don't know a ton about um, those specifically, but I suspect that um, some of their planning is bird friendly and, and maybe not all of it, of course, but yeah, I think, um, I'm not, I'm not as up on that part of things, unfortunately. And then uh, Tom Walsh says he plants native prairie grass on the east side or native prairie on the east side and a nice woodlands in the back. What other native ground cover would be planted, could be planted for shady tree undergrowth? Uh, sure. Besides fern, ginger or umbrella plants. Sure. Um, so 
in the shade, you can get, um, there's some native shrubs that are shade tolerant. Um, uh, well, that one's not, but um, I would encourage you, if you go to the Bird Friendly Iowa website, there is a whole section under their resources um, that matches up native plants and native birds. So you can search for a plant and it'll tell you what, how shade tolerant it is. And it will, it's in three categories. There's native trees and shrubs and there's native grasses and forbs. It might be two or three categories. Um, and you can search by bird. You can say, I'm really interested in getting cedar waxwings to my yard and it'll tell you plants that cedar waxwings like. Or you can search by plant and it'll say, here's the plant, here's the type of growing conditions it needs and here's the type of birds that would come with it. So I really encourage you to go to that birdfriendlyiowa.org um, and there's more information there in the resources tab about matching up native plants and native birds. Thank you. And then uh, we'll just we'll close with this question about uh, your general advice just about feeding the birds. Should we or should we not? Yeah, that's one of those questions. A lot of people think, is it, are we helping the birds? Are we hurting the birds? So in general, especially uh, like this week, for example, where it's really cold, we're, we're doing good by the birds to help them get the food and the energy they need to survive this really frigid temperature. Um, some people wonder if feeding birds is changing their, their natural um, habits or their, you know, are they distracted from foraging for their young? And overall, um, birds can choose when they go to the feeder and they can choose when they find other resources. And so I find no problem feeding the birds as long as you're feeding them something that's safe and healthy for them to eat. Um, and it's, you know, having your bird feeder up longer is not going to discourage them from migrating um, or anything like that. So um, you're not, you're not going to be, you may be making their life easier than it would have been before, which, you know, you can say whether that's uh, an interference you'd like to do or not. But um, overall, bird feeding is not um, detrimental to, to wild birds. Well, thank you, Anna. That was a very informative program. Um, we hope you get to present that to more than just the Ames one, but we're glad to see we're doing some things right. We could always do better, but it's nice to get a kudos from you, the certainly the bird expert. So thank you for taking time to present to our club today. We really appreciated that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It was great fun. Great yeah, questions. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we have uh, next week's program will be, um, just double check. Yeah, next week we have one of our own club members, Jody Stumbo, uh, I believe would be speaking about uh, the Bridge Home, I think is the new rebranding of the Emergency Residence Project. So that will be our program for next week, uh, which would be the uh, 22nd of February. Um, and again, if you are so inclined and you want to hang out for a little bit after the meeting, uh, feel free. We'll leave this meeting open a little bit so we can talk and have some fellowship. And uh, we'll end here with the four-way test. If you would uh, say it with me. Of the things we think, say or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Stay warm, everyone, and thanks, and we'll see you next week. I have a question for Karen. Go for it. Go ahead, Cliff. Um, th th that was very impressive. Uh, I appreciated that very much. And um, uh, I know here at Green Hills, Warren uh, helped me here a little bit. Here at Green Hills, we're concerned with uh, 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 that particular topic. Uh, 
would there be any problem if I shared when you uh, sent out the uh, uh, the uh, the email that uh, the video yeah the video for the program could I share that here at Green Hills and they might want to uh, to send that to residents. It'd be a good idea. Absolutely. I know there's a group that are interested in the bird yes. feeding. They do, Green Hills has a group that does the bird counts during the year and that kind of thing. So. Yeah. yeah. No, you're welcome to share the YouTube video with anybody. Okay, thank you. I, I'd like to do that. Would you agree, Warren? Yes, sure. Good. Good idea. And we had a lot of questions. We always do for our speakers. That's what's fun about this. There's a lot of good questions. I didn't want to ask her, but I imagine it seems like every time we've had a program, we had a question about the derecho. I bet you the derecho wiped out some bird habitat too. I was surprised at how many birds are lost flying into the windows. Yeah, I, I'd have to say I'm probably responsible for a dozen or so every year. So we probably need to do something about that with our sunroom. Not, not a good sound when you hear that big thud and you look down on the patio and you see one down there because uh, sometimes they get up and sometimes they don't. So we gotta, we got to figure that out. Does anybody know what the danger is in non-shade grown coffee? I, uh, what is the danger if there's no shade over the coffee? I would guess it's price and probably geography. If because I'm guessing the shade coffee is more expensive, but I don't. Next time we buy coffee, we'll have to look and see whether that seals on them. But if there is no shade over the coffee, to what extent does it, is that a danger to the birds? That's what I don't quite understand. I don't understand. And <laughs> I think it's the trees that provide it habitat. It doesn't provide a habitat. <laughs> Oh. I, checked, I checked the Folgers box and it has nothing about shade grown. <laughs> so how does one make one of their windows safe for birds? I didn't quite understand yeah. that. Yeah, I'm going to have to go to the website on that one. That's a good question. Put, put uh, black tape on it. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned about uh, about sharing uh, the video. I sent uh, to my brother-in-law in Minnesota the uh, link to the one that the fellow, uh, the Chinese fellow, gave on China China trade, which was, I think, what a fantastic um, presentation. Wasn't that? Yeah, I think awesome. that. Yeah, that was, uh, I think that's some good out. I think that's good outreach. I think that's part of service, you know, yeah, serving and helpful. having those programs. Actually, I think I'm mistaken. It was an Ollie program. No, we had one uh, at Rotary. Yes, it was earlier, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I shared the one with uh, our, the, uh, the doctor here at McFarland. Uh, I thought that was a really good one on the, yeah. on the COVID and the vaccine. The one that you set up, Louie, that was really good. I think that we've had some exceptional programs the uh, last uh, few months, past year. So kudos to whoever has been planning them. Yeah, but, so it's been a, our history our tradition has been that the president elect is the one that would be chairing that program uh, or setting those up. But boy, there's been a faithful group of club members that have been on a committee this year. I know Liz Beck has been very involved and Jenny Legates has certainly helped out as well. Um, in the past, I know I, when I was uh, coordinating programs, Jim Patton also helped out a lot, but you know, that's the beauty of this is anybody has an idea, uh, you know, shoot it to Karen and Karen will get it to Kelsey or Liz. And uh, yeah, I would agree. Good stuff.
Everybody finding enough to do in their house so they can stay warm, not go outside. I was outside working this morning. Uh, I didn't last very long. If I'd had one more layer on, I wouldn't have been able to move. So, uh, <laughs> have you had the peace pipe uh, letters from uh, Tony Khan down at Keokuk as a as a presentation? No. That's a good one. That's really interesting. Um, peace pipe letters. Yeah, peace pipe letters. Tony Khan Keokuk. And uh, it's a uh, preface of it. It's just basically in 1932, uh, the president of the club went to the international convention. I don't remember what was that, somewhere in, uh, in Europe. Decided that coming back from that, then he sent out a, uh, well, he wanted to send out a peace pipe because uh, Chief Keokuk must have liked to do a lot of smoking with the peace pipe. And uh, and so he was going to try to send out a peace pipe, decided that wasn't going to work. He sent out, there was 498 Rotary Clubs around the world in 32, and he sent them out all a handwritten letter. And he got 230 some back. So that's, that'll, that's just going to entice you to get to thinking about this. It's really interesting letters. So yeah, get a hold of Tony, and he'd, be, he'd love to do that. So What was the last name? What was the last name? Tony, Tony what? Tony Khan, C-O-N-N. Okay, thank you. Steve, you got to work on Boone. I don't know if they were on the bird friendly list. You better better get after that Boone community. Uh, there's some of it is, I know. I <laughs> Maverick, so that's in Boone County, but <laughs> that's right. I'll take that credit. But yeah, so. Uh, How's the vaccinations going over there in Story County? I just, out of curiosity, is it? Yeah, the, the question is, how many of you have had your first, at least one shot? Uh, one of our retired docs sent along to, uh, to our Zoom meeting that we have of our retired physicians every Monday morning, a curve regarding the first, uh, the uh, a number of people contracting COVID after the first vaccination and uh, the lines diverge after two weeks, at which point, at two weeks, there is no increase in number of people getting sick. So it looks like after two weeks, after the first shot, uh, it, you probably have very good protection. Well, my wife got proactive because Boone has system has not been working here. And so Tomorrow, if I go down to CDC down in West Des Moines and get my first shot. So uh, there's places to get them out there if you haven't been able to, but it's, but uh, you gotta be pretty proactive in getting it done, so. Here at Green Hills, we got our second shot last Wednesday. No side effects. Out of the Green Hills community and some calls, the answer is no, almost nobody's really had any side effects. I mean, there've been a few people who have said they've had a little bit of, with the, for the shots given, just a little bit of feeling. But I think they reported last week, there had been almost no reactions. They did the whole community. So the second shot was last, well, they finished up Wednesday. And I think they've done almost all of the, uh, senior living communities in Story County at this point. So, because so Andrew Nels was behind Northcrest and a couple of the others. So I finished up two weeks ago on a Wednesday and I haven't heard of any uh, problems with them at all. So that's good. They, they uh, vaccinated everybody in independent living and healthcare, the memory care, all the staff in the whole place. So there are about 300 or more people and they did it very efficiently. They really did. Walgreen from Des Moines did it and uh, boy, they couldn't have been any better. What group was that? What organization was that? Uh, well, from at Northcrest and it was 
Walgreens from Des Moines oh. that set up people. And we had um, some pharmacists. Um, my pharmacist that did mine was from the University of Iowa graduate, but I think she probably lives in Des Moines. And uh, they were all very good. I mean, Green Hills had the same Walgreens kind of an arrangement. I think some of the pharmacists actually are out of the Ames Walgreen location, but they brought some people in as well from some other yeah. Walgreens sites. And they did, I don't know, 450 people in two days, I think. I think McFarland's they've got this age chart. They're working down by age. I haven't looked for a few days. The last time I looked, they were in the middle 80s, I think, on people they were calling to vaccinate to <laughs> who we may know more closely. But it's interesting. You can go look at that chart and they point out kind of where they are in their process. Have you been called, Warren? No, I haven't yet been called. I was called a couple of weeks ago. And I thought it was interesting. Maybe I said this last week. Uh, Peggy has, of course, my partner has gone to the doctor there, uh, health care there for many years, but she's now living in Arizona. She got a call, wanted to know if she wanted to come in for a shot. <laughs> she <laughs> of course, we got here ours at Northcrest, but Walgreen here names did call us and say that we could come in there, but we had already gotten ours. And also the volunteer group, at Mary Greeley was calling all the volunteers. So they called us to see if we wanted to get them there. And we said, well, we were getting them here at Northcrest. So there are other places that are calling people. I got mine through Mary Greeley because I was called in as I assume it's because I was a volunteer. And they had some vaccine left over that that particular day because they asked if I could come right in. Oh, really? Uh, uh, my uh, my uh, Pat is uh, coming going was called by the clinic to come in this Wednesday, so they're working their way down. I'm I'm 89. She's 80, 86, 87. Have you had yeah, both their challenge is, is getting enough doses to give? They would do more if they had more supply. That's yeah, it seems to be the problem all over the country is right volume. I've been on with a lot of Rotary clubs in, in different counties. Every county is running in the process differently, so there's no set formula or procedure. No. I find that quite interesting. I do too. Hmm. Organization. I need to drop off. It's good to see everyone. And yeah, we'll see you, Steve. Everyone. So thank you, uh, and uh, be safe and be warm. Take care. Well, I'll leave you too. Very good meeting. Thank you all. Have a good day. And under the circumstances, stay warm. Is that what they say? <laughs> Later this week, it's going to warm up. So just hang in there. Yep. A few more days. It's only minus one now. Oh. Karen, you want some of a faster connection. Your hand wave is faster than it usually is. <laughs> <laughs> I got a Wi-Fi booster. So oh, you did. Hopefully, it is a little faster. Uh, hopefully, it's a little faster. That's good. <laughs> well, well, maybe. Well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> a little. <laughs> have a good week, all. <laughs> we'll see you guys. Okay. Everybody, have a good week. All right, guys. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. See ya.